I hope and pray everyone is doing well. We are going to be in Genesis chapters 34, 35, and 36. Let's begin with a prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, the creator of the heavens and earth, we are thankful, Father, that we can come to you in prayer, that you hear our prayers, that you love us so much. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to study again from your word. We have been reminded about your power in the book of Genesis your faithfulness, and we have also been reminded about the problem of sin. We pray, Father, that you will help us to continue to draw closer to you every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so today we're going to be in lesson number 17 in your workbook, and that's going to cover Genesis chapters 34 through 36. So I want to begin right now by going back to uh, Genesis chapter 33. If you recall, in our last class, we looked at Jacob as he left Laban. He took his family, all of his livestock, uh, all of his wealth, and he's going to have this encounter uh, with Esau. He had great fear with respect to Esau and what Esau might do. We know that Esau loved him, and Esau was there for him. And so after 20 years where there had been great bitterness and hatred that Esau had, Now we see that things have changed. So when we pick up in Genesis chapter 33, beginning in verse number 12, it says, Then Esau said, Let us take our journey and go, and I will go before you. But he said to him, My Lord knows that the children are frail, and that the flocks and herds which are nursing are a care to me. And if they are driven hard one day, all the flocks will die. Please let my Lord pass on before his servant, And I will proceed at my leisure, according to the place of the cattle that are before me, and according to the pace of the children, until I come to my Lord at Seir. Esau said, Please let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, What need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. Verse 17. Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built for himself a house and made booths for his livestock Verse number 18, now Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. And so I wanted to read that because that's where we find Jacob in Genesis chapter 34. Now, if you recall, we have been given details about the children of Jacob with Leah, with Rachel, and with their uh, maidservants as well. And so we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 34, where we begin to read about something horrific with respect to Dinah. We have mentioned this in times past in the class. When you look at this story, the story of Genesis, the first book of the law, we know that it's not just a story for young kids. There are a lot of uh, challenging things that we read about in this book. And this is another story that we read about as well that is challenging. So we're going to read in Genesis chapter 34 about Dinah, about Simeon, and also about Levi. And that's going to be important because they were all from, they were all children of Leah. And so we're going to see that connection here. And we're also going to be reminded about the problem of sin, the sin with respect to Simeon and Levi and what they're going to do. And with respect to uh, Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, and what he's going to do to Dinah. So let's just read a few passages here and then we'll dive into uh, the actual questions. There are 14 or 15 questions that we're going to look at. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to visit the daughters of the land. I think that's an interesting thought as well. What was she doing going out to visit the daughters of the land? When you think about who these women were and their history, there's something there that I think um, poses some kind of problem or a bad idea or a bad decision by Dinah going out to visit the daughters of the land. When Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he took her and lay with her by force. And so this young man here, this man, however old he may have been, the prince of the land, uh, it appears that he thought that he could do anything that he wanted to do. And so the Bible says that he took her and lay with her by force. So virtually every commentary uh, says the same thing about this, that this man raped Dinah. There are a few thoughts out there that this was something else 
uh, that it was more of a seduction or a seducing of this woman. But my understanding has always been, and I always I can be wrong about this, uh, but the language here seems to be that with uh, taking her by force. And yet there are some other thoughts with respect to that. We see here that he was deeply attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. One of the reasons why some have viewed this as maybe you know some kind of seduction uh, or some type of action prior to marriage uh, instead of the idea of rape is because of the the way that he's responding to uh, to Dinah. He loved her, spoke tenderly to her. Uh, he wants his father to try to get her um, so that he might be able to marry her. And some have compared this with the story in Second Samuel, I believe, chapter 13 with uh, Amnon and Tamar. And the difference is there where Amnon took Tamar uh, and then after uh, the sin that he committed, he wanted nothing to do with her. So sometimes that is something that has come up as well. Uh, but my understanding has been just reading this from times past um, that this idea of taking her by force is the idea of of he, he he raped her. And so he was deeply attracted in verse number three to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, get me this young girl for a wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob kept silent until they came in. Then Hamar, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved. And they were very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing ought not to be done. But Hamar spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter, Please give her to him in marriage. Enter Mary with us, give your daughters to us, and take our daughters for yourselves. So if you are the children of Israel reading this in the wilderness, uh, that language there I think would certainly stand out, this idea of intermarriage uh, between these individuals here. And I think certainly that would have been a, uh, a big red flag, hopefully, as they read this. Thus you shall live with us, and the land shall be open before you, Live and trade in it and acquire property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, If I find favor in your sight, then I will give whatever you say to me. Ask me ever so much bridal payment and gift, and I will give according as you say to me. But give me the girl in marriage. But Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor with deceit, because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. So what we're going to find is that Simeon and Levi, uh, the, the brothers of Dinah, they're going to set up uh, these men here. And these men are trying to make some type of deal, some type of negotiation. They're trying to, you know, appease what seemingly has already had taken place here. And, and so what we find later on in verse 14, they said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised. For that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we consent to you. If you will become like us and that every male of you be circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you and we will take our daughters for ourselves and we will live with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and go. Now their words seemed reasonable to Hamer and Shechem, Hamer's son. The young man did not delay to do the thing because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now he was more respected than all the household of his father. So he's going to get all the men in the town or in the city to to be circumcised. And obviously that would create a lot of pain. And that's what we find in verse number 25. It came about on the third day when they were in pain that two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came upon the city unawares and killed every male. So this action here will have consequences when we get to Genesis chapter 49. They took their flocks. I'm sorry, let's go back to verse number 26. They killed Hamar and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house 
and went forth. And that's interesting as well, that she's still at his house. Jacob's sons came upon the slain and looted the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds and their donkeys and that which was in the city and that which was in the field. And they captured and looted all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives, even all that was in the houses. So when you read Genesis chapter 34, it certainly is a reminder again of these individuals who are on a journey of faith. We see a lot of sin in the book of Genesis. We see a lot of terrible decisions as well in this book. And so the author of this workbook said, okay, I will admit it. I could be completely wrong about what Levi and Simeon did to Shechem. However, considering the message that the wilderness wandering Jews need to hear on their way into the promised land, I'm beginning to wonder if there isn't a different message in this section of scripture than I had previously thought. So I don't know exactly what he may have previously thought. So he says, this lesson will share why, and you'll be free to disagree with me, but give it some thought. So the way that this lesson is presented and the way that this lesson is put together is is certainly making the case, it appears, that what Simeon and Levi did with respect to these people uh, in Canaan, with killing the men, uh, it seems to be something that the Israelites are going to, could look back on and look at. Um, I think that may be what he's trying to get across here. But let's go ahead and look at these questions Uh, together. So the first section is called beginning a judgment on the land's inhabitants. So question number one, what is one of God's number one warnings for the wilderness wandering Jews as they approached the promised land in passages like Exodus chapter 34 and Deuteronomy chapter seven? Let's just read those real quickly here in Exodus chapter 34 and verse number 12. The Bible says, watch yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you are going, or it will become a snare in your midst. So number one, make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land, but rather you are to tear down their altars, smash their sacred pillars, and cut down their asherim, for you shall not worship any other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Otherwise, you might make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, And they would play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods. And someone might invite you to eat of his sacrifice. And you might take some of his daughters for your sons. And his daughters might play the harlot with their gods. And cause your sons also to play the harlot with their gods. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse number 3. The Bible says, furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. So clearly we can see the point that's trying to be emphasized here as one of the big warnings with respect to the nation of Israel uh, when it came to uh, intermarrying uh, with these other people. Instead, question number two, what was Israel supposed to do to the inhabitants of the promised land according to Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 2. Well, we see here that they were to destroy them. In verse 2 of Deuteronomy 7 and verse 2, And when the Lord your God delivers them before you, and you defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, and show no favor to them. And so we see exactly what they were supposed to do. They weren't to have a covenant with these people. They were to destroy them. They were not to engage in idolatry or intermarry with these individuals. So question number three, when we have this in mind, and we have seen the numerous parallels between the accounts of Genesis and the message the wilderness Jews needed to hear, what message would Israel get from Genesis chapter 34? Well, I think one of the big messages, obviously, is with this negotiation that's trying to take place here, where um, the father of Uh, The father, Hamar, the father of Shechem, is trying to make a negotiation with Jacob. And it's interesting how Jacob is, for the most part, fairly silent throughout all of this until after Simeon and Levi decide to kill everyone. So certainly what they would be able to take away here is that this intermarrying is not going to take place. The the judgment that Simeon and Levi uh, did upon the people or upon the men at that time 
um, they would certainly would be able to pick up on that. Although I think you could also say there's a lot of challenges here with this story with the actions of Simeon and Levi, as we'll see later on um, in Genesis chapter 49. And so there's just a lot of different thoughts that um, that could arise here as a result of these actions that are taking place. But if we're just following the questions, what would come to mind is uh, that these individuals, that these people, that these uh, other people of, of the land would have to be destroyed and that there could be no interaction with them. Question number four says this, or is asking this, is Jacob's rebuke in Genesis 34 and verse number 30 a message from God or a lack of faith on Jacob's part? Before you answer this question, notice Genesis chapter 35 and verse 5 and consider what bearing that has on this question. So if you go back, we read most of Genesis chapter 34. After Simeon and Levi have killed all the men, And that seems to be pretty extreme as well, that they're killing all of the men of the town or of the city. And not only are they going to kill them, but they loot the city. They take their flocks, their herds, their donkeys. They take all of their wealth, all of their little ones and their wives. So the response of Jacob in verse number 30, he said, You have brought trouble on me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the the, the Perizzites, and my men being few in number. They will gather together against me and attack me, and I will be destroyed, I and my household. Now, the author of this material said to look at Genesis 35 and verse number 5. We find Jacob and his family leaving Shechem to go to Bethel. And in verse number 5, it says, As they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And so while there seems to be great fear in Genesis 34 and verse number 30 with Jacob and what's going to take place or what's going to happen to him, when I first read that, I thought about more of a lack of faith, uh, a lack of faith with respect to the fear. And the reason why I said that, um, I guess it would be a a natural response when your sons have killed (laughs) all of these men, uh, there's going to be some kind of retaliation at some point in time. But I also thought about the promises that God had given to Jacob. You could also add to this all of the different interactions that Jacob had. He had been delivered by Laban. He had been delivered uh, by or from Esau and from Laban. He had these interactions with the angels. And so through it all, God is still providing for him and also protecting him. Uh, so it could have just been that that was his reaction because of the sinful nature of what Simeon and Levi did, killing all of these men. Question number five takes us to Genesis chapter 35 and the return to Bethel. What direction does God give to Jacob in Genesis chapter 35? And why is it surprising that God had to do that? So if you recall back in Genesis chapter 28, remember back in Genesis chapter 28, Uh, Jacob was able to, he had a dream and he saw a ladder in verse number 12 that was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. After this dream, Jacob awoke in verse 16 from his sleep and said, surely The Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. Then in verse number 19, he called the name of that place Bethel, the house of God. That's what Bethel means. However, previously, the name of the city had been Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take, And will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety. Then the Lord will be my God. This stone, which I have set up as a pillar, will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So now fast forward back to Genesis chapter 35 and verse 1. The Lord said to Jacob, or then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and live there, and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. And so question number five, this is what God wants him to do. 
And God also tells him to make an altar there for him, which I think is interesting because when you look at Abraham throughout his journey or uh, life, he was always making altars. And so I think that's one thought um, that you could say is a little bit surprising, um, God having to tell him to, uh, to make an altar there. Uh, question number six, considering Exodus 32 and passages like Joshua 24 and verse number 23, how does, how does Jacob's command to his family mirror what the wilderness wandering Jews needed to hear? So let's continue on in Genesis 35. God tells him to leave. Now in verse number two, Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away, and remember Jacob was very rich, put away the foreign gods which are among you. Now isn't that interesting? Remember when they left the house of Laban, Rachel had took the idols that had been in the house. And she told her father that it was the period of, uh, of her menstruation and so she could not get up. And now we see another reference to these foreign gods which are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. So was it the fact that Simeon and Levi had looted the entire city and took all of the possessions uh, from Shechem's house? Was it that or from there that they got these idol gods? Maybe that was the case. But it seems to be when I read this and just kind of thinking about the bigger picture here, this seems to be something that that was a part of their households, that these that they had these foreign gods. And we talked about that a little bit last week, about this journey that these people are on. And obviously these foreign gods were, were nothing. And the point I think the author is trying to make in this question here, when you look at Exodus chapter 32, this is when Moses finds the people and they had built the uh, golden calf. And we know that idolatry was a major problem for the Israelites time and time again. That's what we read about in Exodus chapter 32. And then when you turn over to Joshua chapter 24 and verse number 23, the Bible says, Now there put away the foreign gods which are in your midst and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. So this was just a, a seem, this seemed to be a big problem, a constant problem uh, for, the, for the people of God. And so there's great uh, comparison that we find here with what Jacob told his family uh, what they needed to do. And, you know, I don't know if that we we probably could say that says something maybe even about Jacob. You think about Jacob and the fact that he's been given these great promises by God, yet he's being told to to go and to make an altar. He seems to have some doubts at the end of chapter 34, and now he's telling his household to get rid of these idols as well. And so there's certainly room for these individuals to grow uh, in their walk with God. Question number seven, why do you think Jacob also buried the rings that were in their ears? Uh, This seemed to have some type of connection with these uh, foreign gods in verse four. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had and the rings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. So I, I believe there was some kind of connection there. And maybe he hid them there. I don't know exactly why he may have hid them there. Um, but uh, but nonetheless, he did. And there's certainly a, um, a connection there with those idol gods. Question number eight, what happened to the cities that Israel traveled past in Genesis chapter 35? And how did that parallel Israel's conquest into the promised land? So in verse number five, you look in, in Genesis 35, the Bible says, As they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So think about what he said again in chapter 34. Uh, there was great fear. He said that we are few. And now what we find that there was terror upon the cities as they traveled through. And so as you think about Israel's conquest, I think about uh, Joshua chapter 2 and the story of, of Rahab and how she talked about how the hearts of the people had melted. And so there was that terror, there was that fear uh, that the people often had as they heard and saw the children of Israel. And so that leads right into question number nine, why the wilderness wandering Jews needed to hear the message of Genesis 35 and also later on in verse number 11 and 12. So what we have here, let's, let's pick up in, in verse number six of Genesis chapter 35. 
So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. He built an altar, altar there, so he did listen to God. He built the altar there and called the place El Bethel because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. That goes back to chapter 28. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died. We're introduced to her in Genesis 24 and verse number 59. And she was buried below Bethel under the oak. Verse number 9. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Pat and Aram and he blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Well, that sounds similar because we already read about that when he wrestled with the man or the angel of God. Thus he called him Israel. So maybe this was a more uh, formal setting. He's, he's, he's going through all of this again uh, with Jacob. He says, your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Thus he called him Israel. God also said to him, I am God Almighty. That sounds like Genesis 17 and verse 1 when God was speaking to Abraham. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you. And kings shall come forth from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you. And I will give the land to your descendants after you. There's the answer right there. These verses, certainly as the Israelites were reading these uh, passages, it certainly would bring about great confidence to, uh, to the people. And so that's something very important that the people uh, needed, to, needed to hear and needed to remember uh, as well. Let's see here. I'm a little bit behind on my slides. All right. All right. So let's look at question number 10 here. This section is called death. So what we find here, we find Rachel is going to die. Uh, We just saw Rebecca's nurse, Deborah. She has died. And now we see in verse number 13 of Genesis chapter 35, Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. So Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him Bethel. Then they journeyed from Bethel. And when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth, and she suffered severe labor. So when you go back to Genesis chapter 30, remember the great feud between Rachel and Leah and the, the pain that Rachel had because she wasn't able to have any children. In chapter 30 and verse 1, now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she became jealous of her sister and she said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. So it is a little interesting, it is a little ironic that she is getting what she had asked for, but due to this severe uh, delivery, she's going to die. And so she suffered severe labor. When she was in severe labor, the midwife said to her, do not fear, for now you have another son. So she had already had Joseph. It came about as her soul was departing, for she died, that she named him Ben-Oni, the son of my sorrow, but his father called him Benjamin, the son of the right hand. And so what we find here is that Rachel would have Joseph and Benjamin. They're going to become a big part of the story, particularly Joseph for the rest or in the rest of the book of Genesis that we'll see beginning next week. And so we see here now that Rachel has died. And what is interesting, and this is really question 11, we find that After she died, in verse number 19, uh, she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a pillar over her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. So typically you see like Abraham and Sarah uh, where they're going to be buried uh, in the same place. Uh, But she's being buried as they are traveling along. So that's my understanding about what's shocking about this burial here in question number 11. Question number 12, considering that Rachel had been Jacob's favorite wife, why is his renaming of Ben-Oni to Benjamin somewhat surprising? Well, my thought had been, you know, initially it seems like he's going against her wishes, 
because she is naming this son, son of my sorrow, uh, and he does rename him uh, son of the right hand. Uh, and so that to me is the biggest thing as to why, you know, Rachel, you know, he loved Rachel so much. He understood the pain that she was going through. Um, so I'm not for sure exactly the, uh, some other great significance as to why he changed the name. It, it could have been uh, the son of my sorrow. That certainly is a, is a, is a tough name and um, connected to something terrible. Um, son of the right hand. Um, maybe there's something with respect to just how he's going to f- view Benjamin uh, and the blessing that he is in his sight. So maybe that's something um, as well as to why he decided to rename her, rename him. Uh, but the big thing I would say is the fact that he did do that, uh, even though that was one of the last things that she was going to do. So we find that Rachel now has died. We find Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, had died. And then in verse number 21, we see Israel journey done. And we see another major sin taking place in verse number 22. It came about while Israel was dwelling in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Now there were 12 sons of Jacob, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. So that shows just how significant that sin would be. And I believe we'll see the significance of that as well in Genesis chapter 49. Then Simeon and Levi. So his three oldest boys, we see tremendous sin on their part in these stories. And what we find here, again, we find that the book of Genesis doesn't try to hide any of this. Moses is not sugarcoating any of these terrible acts that these people had committed. And so that is something that I think is important as well. Also in Genesis chapter 35, this isn't really pertaining to the questions, but I do want to touch on this. In verse number 28, it says, now the days of Isaac were 180 years. So we see Isaac now has died. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. An old man of ripe age and his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. I think that's important as well, don't you? Where you had this 20-year gap or separation between Esau and Jacob. They've been reconciled, as we saw back in chapter 33, and now they bury their father together. So I think that says something really important. Then in chapter 36, we find these are the records of the generations of Esau, that is Edom. And we've seen that language throughout the book, the records of the generations. We see that as well in verse number 9 of chapter 36. These then are the records of the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. And then in verse number 19, these are the sons of Esau, that is Edom, and these are their chiefs. And then in verse number 31, now these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the sons of Israel. So we get great detail, lots of names, lots of information here in chapter 36 with respect to the descendants of Esau. Now in verse number 6, Where had Esau, and this takes us to question number 13, where had Esau acquired all his possessions according to verse number 6? A couple of thoughts here. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan. We know that brought about great distress upon his parents. And verse number 6, then Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all of his household and his livestock and all of his cattle and all his goods, which he had acquired in the land of Canaan. And went to another land away from his brother Jacob. So he had acquired all of his possessions according uh, to this passage in the land of Canaan. Question 14. However, when Jacob departed to Canaan, what did Esau do? He ended up leaving and moving for the sake of his brother. He went to another land away from his brother Jacob. For their property had become too great for them to live together. And the land where they sojourned could not sustain them because of their livestock. So that's another interesting thought as well, what Esau is doing now on behalf of his brother. So I think the big take-home point for the Israelites, which takes us to question number 15, which will wrap up our lesson for today, is we see here that there is peace, uh, that Esau peacefully left the land or allowed Jacob to go there 
and his family to go there. And certainly, just as Jacob was, was being blessed here, they also would be blessed too when the time came for them to take the land. Obviously, it would take a lot of work, but God would be with them just as there, were, there was terror as Jacob and his family traveled. The same would happen with the nation of Israel as they began to take the promised land. So when they read this, I think or I believe that they should have taken great confidence about look what God had done for Abraham, for Isaac, for Jacob, and these promises were also to their descendants, which would mean them. So they were to take great confidence in the in these promises as well. So that's the lesson. There may be questions. I have questions. If you have questions, please let me know. Um, one of the big things that just continues to stand out to me is the problem of sin. Uh, we're going to continue to see that with the story of Joseph and what the bro- what his brothers do to him. And this is a, a, a problem that we see. And yet, going back to Genesis chapter 12, remember, we get that sneak preview of, of things to come. Uh, the blessing promise through Abraham Uh, Through him, all families of the earth would be blessed. And that blessing promise would come through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so while we see a lot of sin in this book, we also see hope of what is to come through the Messiah. I hope this helps. Take care and God bless.